Hi, this is Eric once again. This is episode 25 of Survival Medicine, and I'm going to talk about radiation exposures and injuries. Well, obviously with what's happened in Japan that's raised some concern about uh, uh, nuclear explosions and fallouts and do people on the west coast of America need to be popping you know, potassium iodide um, and all this stuff. Uh, but it's more than just uh, perhaps a nuclear reactor issue. Uh, you know, there's the classic idea of an atomic explosion, a nuclear explosion uh, used in uh, warfare. Uh, and we're really not going to talk too much about that. That's a fairly extreme and rare circumstance that you have the utter nuclear holocaust devastation. We're going to spend more time on what would be perhaps a little bit more plausible, um, even though it's still exquisitely unlikely, and that's going to be something like a reactor accident like happened in Chernobyl, which is a picture shown here, or Three Mile Island, or what happened in Japan. Something I think is perhaps uh, more likely to occur in the spectrum, again, all these incidents, is I feel, are very rare or unlikely to occur, but in the spectrum of nuclear attacks or nuclear accidents, I think this particular one, a dirty bomb, is perhaps the most likely of the set. Uh, and this is uh, some information from WikiLeaks that came out uh, fairly recent, uh, in the fe fairly recent past, this February 18th, 2011. Uh, and, and basically this was showing that Al-Qaeda was actively seeking nuclear materials to try and use in a dirty bomb. Now these materials can be found in a lot of different places. In the field that I'm in, which is medicine, uh, there is radioisotopes that we use in medicine all the time. Um, and so these things are, are fairly common, and I think if somebody was really determined, uh, they could probably get away with uh, getting a hold of some of this. Uh, back in April, so just about a month later, um, the uh, Al-Qaeda group uh, threatened to unleash a nuclear hellstorm uh, if uh, Osama bin Laden was caught or assassinated. Well, we now know that that has occurred. And so there's uh, things being thrown around is about Al-Qaeda having a nuclear weapon placed somewhere in Europe that they're going to detonate. Uh, again, I, I think uh, that's unlikely. Uh, I, you know, I have plans to go to Europe in the near future, so I'm not really too freaked out about it. Um, but the, uh, the dirty bomb thing, I think, is, is real. That's one that I am concerned about. So what is a dirty bomb? Basically, that's taking standard explosives and putting some kind of nuclear material that has some degree of radioactivity with it. So you take one of these and you detonate it, and it basically throws this nuclear dust into the air, and these nuclear particles in the air that just kind of scatter and, and cause contaminant. It doesn't cause the fission-type reactions um, that the uh, you know, nuclear explosions have um, that release tremendous amounts of energy. Uh, I said fission, I probably meant fusion uh, reactions with the nuclear bombs. Now, there's the talk about a uh, suitcase nuke. Uh, these are probably uh, uh, questionable. Um, there's been some discussion that perhaps the idea of a suitcase nuke was actually a honeypot uh, put out by the CIA to see if they could capture terrorists. So does one of these exist? Uh, who knows? Um, we do know that there are tactical nuclear devices that could be put on top of our artillery shells or small rockets, and these are sort of battlefield use. Uh, so these are much smaller, probably in the neighborhood of 60 megatons to 80 megatons. Uh, these do exist, uh, and I think in, in, if we talk about a terrorist event, uh, this would be perhaps more likely than, than some crazy getting a hold of an ICBM and launching a, a you know a massive attack. You definitely don't want to be around when the boys in blue show up to wave Geiger counters over your uh, body and uh, see if you've been irradiated. So what are we going to talk about? Uh, there's different ways of um, using terms with radiation. Uh, there's at least four different uh, measurements of radiation. There's a rim, there's a rad. Those are uh, fairly equivalent. And then there's a gray and a sievert. Uh, so it's about 100 rims per uh, gray or receiver and 100 rads per sievert. So the rim and the rad are about a 100 to 1 to the gray and the sievert. Not that that means all that much, but just so people kind of know if you happen to hear the terms. Something that is important that we use in medical terminology is what's called an LD50. And that means what dose is required to kill 50% of the people exposed. So if we're talking about an LD50 with radiation, what level of radiation will kill half the people that are exposed to it? So that's a term, LD50. So what is radiation specifically? 
uh, when, you, when you hear the term ratio, what is that? Well, it's a spectrum. You've got non-ionizing radiation and ionizing radiation. You know, the non-ionizing radiation can include radio waves, microwaves, you know, just heat. Uh, it gets into the infrared uh, and then the visible light. Uh, and then as you move into the ionizing side where you can actually damage DNA, uh, then you get into X-rays and gamma rays and things like that. Uh, where you break chemical bonds. Now, the lower levels of the radiation, the non-ionizing, can still transfer energy, right? Uh, so solar panels are a great example. Light hits the solar panels and actually generates electricity. So the non-ionizing radiation carries energy with it. So let's think about it a little differently. Let's say these electromagnetic particles are, are a wiffle ball. So if you're standing in front of this girl throwing the wiffle ball at you as a radio wave, you're not probably not too worried about it. It's going to hit you, bounce off, no damage, no harm, no big deal. But if you take that same wiffle ball and you shove it into this cannon, you probably don't want to be standing in front of that, and that would be more like a gamma wave. So if there's a radiation source, you can get several different types of particles or rays. The alpha particles and beta particles are kind of the lower energy ones. A sheet of paper will stop alpha particles. No big deal. Beta particles can be stopped by just your layers of clothing. Uh, gamma rays, however, have a lot of more energy with it, and they will pass through organic tissue. They'll damage bonds and damage DNA. And the only way to stop the gamma rays is to get behind several feet of concrete or several inches of lead. So radiation not only can damage DNA and cause problems along that line, but it can actually you know, burn or destroy tissue as it just pounds and pummels it with all these, you know, very, very tiny particles. Uh, so you can get radiation burns. And obviously, if you're exposed to enough to these high energy particles and waves, uh, it can be fatal. As an example, uh, Alexander um, Litvinenko uh, got some, a very, very small amount of those uh, polonium that was probably put on his dinner salad or whatever. And then over the course of a month, he had a slow and uh, sort of tortuous death due to radiation poisoning. Now, let's talk a little bit about uh, some of the deeper effects, the DNA effects. You can have the gamma rays and the x-rays that will pass through and, and hit the DNA and cause problems. But you can also have the gamma rays or x-rays go through and just like a pool cue hitting a, a pool ball, it can hit larger molecules and these larger molecules will then have energy transferred it. And then these big molecules can then tumble through the DNA kind of like a bowling ball rather than a marble. You know, the x-rays perhaps are marble and then we've got a bowling ball that goes through and can smash the DNA. That's direct damage. There's also indirect damage to the, your DNA strand, and that's when radiation charges water and creates a free radical, and the free radical can then donate electrons to other chemicals, uh, bonds, and upset that. So when you're exposed to radiation, the things that uh, most rapidly divide, like bone marrow cells, your white blood cells, um, you know, your intestinal cells, the skin, those are what's most profoundly affected first. Uh, that's why when people get chemotherapy or radiation, you know, their hair falls out. Uh, sometimes they'll get sores in their mouth or diarrhea. Your neurons, your muscles, those things are a lot less affected. Uh, and the reason I bring that up is if you have somebody that's exposed to radiation and then they start having neurologic effects like a seizure, you know, they have had a massive dose and uh, they're going to die. And there's nothing that, that can be done about that. Now let's talk about... Uh, what kind of radiation doses are, are dangerous or potentially fatal. Now, I, I imagine a lot of people know what cardiac catheterization is. That's when you you uh, have this dye put in. They use an x-ray to look at the vessels of the heart. And so if you took the amount of radiation, um, and instead of just putting it in a small area of the body, like looking at the heart, but we put it throughout your entire body, head to toe, and we multiply that by eight times the amount of a cardiac catheterization. That gives you the, your LD50 for humans. So half the people exposed to that level of radiation would die. And that's probably about 3.5 sieverts or 350 rem. Now you've got two different types of effects related to radi radiation. One is a deterministic effect, which is specific to the amount of radiation you're exposed to. So... If, if you have a, a certain level of radiation exposure, you can expect that the skin will burn and die. Um, that, those are deterministic effects. You also have the stochastic effects, which are probabilistic effects. And, and these are somewhat more random. Uh, this could be birth defects or the chance that you develop cancer in, later in life. The people exposed to the atomic bomb in Nagasaki and Hiroshima, 
Um, not all of them developed cancer. Some did, some did not. Uh, so there's a little bit of some randomness to that, and that's what these effects are, the stochastic effects. So do we all need to go out and take potassium iodide or store it up? Well, it depends. If you're near uh, a nuclear plant or nuclear reactor, uh, it may not be unreasonable to have some on hand in case there's some kind of meltdown or explosion or problem uh, to take that. Um, but I think if you're in the middle of uh, Kansas and Tokyo goes up with a nuclear reactor related to a tsunami and earthquake, you probably do not need to be taking iodine for that. So a nuclear power plant, uh, the short-term deterministic effects are nowhere near as severe as the, the nuclear weapons. You know, right? the, the nuclear weapon has a lot more deterministic, a lot more in, instant radiation. So with a nuclear power plant, fallout's a bigger problem. Um, and those types of fallout things are uh, kind of lead you to the stochastic effects or the chances that you develop cancer later in life or, or have birth defects. So fallout radiation is worse after the first minute. The first 24 hours, it's a lot more radioactive. You've got the gamma waves and the beta particles, and those will degrade fairly quickly in a relative sense. And, and after the 24 hours, uh, the internal contamination is your greatest worry. Now, obviously, fallout can affect a wide area based off the winds and the humidity uh, and the amount of uh, uh, fallout available. So again, think of fallout as radioactive dust. These are, are discrete particles that are floating in the air and blown by the wind and then will settle depending on how heavy they are um, and land on different things, land on your, your garden or your crops or get into the water. Uh, so that's what makes fallout a problem. And again, we worry about skin contact, we worry about inhalation of these uh, radioactive materials or ingestion where you, you consume them or eat them. Now, nuclear weapons, again, I think this is very unlikely, but a lot more devastating, right? There's a blast effect, which is a, a nuclear wave and nuclear wind, a blast wave and a blast wind. Uh, the wave and wind can knock structures over in and of itself. There's the thermal or just the heat transfer with flash burns and flames. Uh, and then the third piece is the radiation uh, with the uh, whole body radiation dose with the gamma rays and neutrons and then the residual fallout. Now the initial radiation that you get with a nuclear explosion is uh, highest within the first minute. Uh, you get this whole body irradiation uh, with gamma rays and neutrons and you can develop what's called an acute radiation syndrome and we'll talk about that in just a second. With this initial radiation spike there's not a lot of internal contamination um, and then most survivors will have all three types of injuries, radiation, blast, and thermal. The acute radiation syndrome has three phases. There's the, the initial phase, the prodromal phase, which you can get nausea and vomiting, diarrhea, fatigue, you just feel really run down. You have this latent interval where you think you're getting better, things look good, and then you have the, the manifest illness, uh, which is the third stage that can affect your blood, your GI, your CNS, and then you'll either get better or you won't. You'll either get better or die from the manifest illness stage. Now with acute radiation syndrome, timing of vomiting is a good thing to consider in terms of severity. The sooner you start puking, the more severe the exposure. So if people start vomiting in less than 12 hours after exposure, you're talking about an LD50 level. So half the patients will die. If you vomit within the first hour of exposure, then you're almost assured death with 90 to 100% uh, fatality. So let's kind of put this into a scenario or put this into a case that we might uh, uh, can use as an example. So we're going to pick on our favorite bad guys at the moment, the Al-Qaeda freakazoids, um, and say that they uh, are able to get hold of a tactical nuclear weapon, you know, that would fit on the top of an arterial shell, you know, fired out of a cannon, not an ICBM. And so uh, the whack jobs get hold of one of these, and they decided um, that they want to use uh, about a 60 kiloton, so we're going to take about a third of this, so let's expect the nine-hour fallout to be at about 40 miles from ground zero at nine hours. And let's say they detonated at the ship channel of Houston with the prevailing winds from the southeast. So now what are you going to do? If Obviously if you're in ground zero within the first several hundred meters of this exposure you're probably screwed. Um, if you're outside of that initial blast zone um, but you're in, in the danger zone of fallout, uh, how are you going to protect yourself? What, what are you going to need to do uh, to prevent uh, exposure and problems related to that. Well, 
again, think back to what we said earlier. We avoid inhalation. We avoid in, avoid in, ingestion of in particles, and we want to pro, um, stop any prolonged skin tact, uh, skin contact of, of these fallout particles. So if you are stuck in a residence, or stuck in a home, or stuck in a building, and you're not going to be able to get out, you need to seal it off as best as possible. All houses have leaks in it, you know, that gets around your doors, gets around your windows. You need to put plastic sheeting as best you can to prevent dust from entering into your house. Uh, if you're going to be out and around, you may want to use just a standard uh, mask. Again, you want to filter out dust-sized particles, not anything that's super microscopic. So, uh, I, you know, some of these standard masks would probably do fine. If you have... Uh, the potential for having these fallout particles land on you, you want to get out of the clothes and you want to wash off really, really well. And you want to take the clothes that have potential exposure and perhaps double bag them in some uh, heavy duty trash bags and kind of get them aside, get them away. Uh, but again, lots of water will wash off this dust. If you can just get the dust off of you, you're probably fine. So again, for alpha and beta particles, change your clothes, use lots of water. Watch what you eat. Make sure the food uh, doesn't have the chance of getting contaminated. Again, think of dust landing on stuff. It's not that the food is made radioactive by the, uh, the magic radiation going through invisibly through the air like radio waves. This is actually dust landing on these things that uh, would contaminate it. So watch your food. Watch your water. Uh, use a mask if you're going to be in an area where the fallout's are landing. And again, we're not talking about around the world. This is uh, for these types of events that's going to be fairly localized. Tape your windows, shut off ventilation systems uh, to prevent bringing in uh, contaminated air. And if you're in an area of fallout, if you're in the area where the dust is going to land on you, taking potassium iodide is probably a reasonable thing. Again, if I lived in Oregon and what happened in Japan, uh, you know, went off, I, I'm not going to be taking potassium iodide for that. I'm not going to worry about it. Uh, this stuff will fall out of the atmosphere long before it reaches me. Uh, if you're close to the area of detonation. Uh, you know, gamma rays are concerned, so you have to worry about that. Getting behind some concrete or lead will help protect uh, that initial phase. But if it's me, and I'm in this area, and I can, I'm going to grab my bug out bag, I'm going to get my bug out vehicle, and I'm leaving town. I'm just going to get out of the way of this dust. I'm going to go somewhere where I'm going to be safe until things sort of settle out, uh, and then we can kind of come back in at a later phase. So anyways, I hope that kind of puts things in perspective and uh, gets people a little bit more educated about what is radiation, uh, what are the things that we worry about from a medical side, uh, and what you could potentially do to protect yourself. Uh, again, the best thing to do is avoid exposure. Uh, I don't think, uh, I'm not worried about a nuclear holocaust with the big giant, you know, 200 uh, megaton explosions. I am worried about dirty bombs. Uh, and to a lesser extent, worried about perhaps some of the smaller tactical nukes. Uh, but again, I think those will be hard for anybody to get hold of and hard to use as, with uh, current intelligence efforts. But the dirty bomb, that could be obtained. Uh, you know, that could that, people could work that one. But again, thanks for watching. I, I really appreciate everybody's support. I like the comments, um, and stay safe.